and good afternoon. Hello. I'd like to uh, thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you about the photography of the American Civil War. Now, before I begin my presentation, um, I do have just a few things that I want to mention uh, before we, uh, we begin. The photographs that I'll be showing you in today's presentation are uh, three different types. We'll be looking at um, albumin prints, which were prints that were printed on paper using uh, silver nitrate chemicals for the development. We'll be looking at ambrotypes, which were um, printed onto glass, and oftentimes they were painted. And then we'll also be looking at um, wet plate collodion, which were um, on metal. Now, in terms of Civil War photography, the most common photographic form that they used actually was the tintype. And I have a little treat for you I brought in, uh, since this is the genealogical society of an actual tintype, so that you can see an, an example, a historical example, of what a photograph uh, printed on metal would look like. And again, this is the most common type. This type was more common than the daguerreotype because tin was cheaper than the copper that the image was developed on. This is actually a family, port or family picture of my own. On my maternal grandmother's side, the Lymans, who I understand were involved in the founding of Connecticut. And so this is a, the Lyman family home. This dates to the late 1800s. I'm very embarrassed I don't have more genealogical information. <laughs> but um, I just thought I'd pass this around so that you could get an example of what these photographs um, look like. If you could just not touch the surface, I would appreciate it. And if you could just make sure at the end <coughs> that it gets returned to me, I would also appreciate that as well. Um, do we need the lights yeah, off yeah, or down? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be speaking for about 45 minutes on the photography of the Civil War. The Civil War was a very complex and very nuanced historical event. And with that complexity, 45 minutes is not enough time at all. I mean, we really need to be together for days for me to really adequately cover this, this event. And so what I'm really doing is just providing a sort of broad historical outline. And since I am speaking to a genealogical society, the intent of this uh, presentation is to simply provide you with a historical context that may be useful to you as you go forth and do your own genealogical research. So I don't have a lot of super specifics in here, but again, enough to hopefully provide you with context. Now, because we only have, you know, only 45 minutes, I had to really pare it down. This talk was originally an hour and a half. And so I had to pare it down. And so when you have to be selective, um, I always think, well, what's the most important thing? And in my mind, the most important contribution that Civil War photography makes, both socially as well as artistically, is the way that the photography captures death. So I just want to warn everybody ahead of time that I will be showing photographs that have in them the bodies of people who were killed during the war. So just know that that's something um, that we will be looking at. The other thing that I want to mention is because of time constraints, 45 minutes, and because I do typically digress, it's easy for me to do, I ask that you please hold questions until the end when we do our question and answer session. All right, so with that, let's get started. And sorry this is small, but I hope that everyone uh, can, see, can see well enough. So I want to start out by pointing out that, technically speaking, the Civil War is not the first war to have been documented with photography. We do actually see photographs that were taken in the Mexican-American War of 1846. Now, primarily in this conflict, the photography was um, in the form of daguerreotypes, and they were not widely circulated. We also see photography being used to document the Crimean War of 1855. Now, in this case, we have an example here. You can see that the primary subject matter is landscapes. We have virtually uh, no other type of subject except for landscapes, and they do not depict the battlefields, but just kind of the landscapes before and after. And similar to the photography that was taken in the Mexican-American War, these images were not widely circulated. Therefore, it makes Civil War photography really important because this is the first war 
that is documented consistently from beginning to end. And these were photographs that were widely circulated. The, pu the public did see them. So that was something um, that was very important. Now, in terms of who is taking these photographs, okay, it seems that historians cannot come up with a consensus. I have read numbers that have been in the 300s. There were 300 photographers out there, um, you know, looking at, and, you know, taking photographs. I've read 1,000, and I've read 3,000. So there's kind of a big range there. Now, despite the un uncertainties we have about how many photographers were working during the Civil War, we do know that it did, in the end, produce thousands of photographic images. And um, again, these were images that were um, widely circulated. Now, um, I can look at another example here. Before we get into the history of the American Civil War, I do want to discuss some of the general features of photography. There are certain components of photography's history that I think that we do need to keep in mind when we're looking at um, Civil War photography. It kind of contextualizes this history. And there's a specific type of photograph that I think is important for us to consider, and that is the post-mortem portrait. And we're seeing an example of one up here. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this in and connecting the general history of photography with the more specific um, Civil War photography is that I think when we look at Civil War photographs, there is a very common subject, developed me more later on in the war, of depicting landscapes, the battle landscapes, with those killed in battle. The idea of photography being used to record death, therefore, is not something we see for the first time ever in Civil War history, but it actually has a historical precedence with these type of photographs. The other reason why I think this is important for us to just briefly look is I have a suspicion that these type of photographs influence the very distinct style that we see of these photographs that are showing these, these bodies, uh, the people that are killed during the war. Now, the post-mortem portrait originates in Victorian period England, but it does find popular articulation in America as well. And it seems that the desire for these type of portraits it has a few different motivations. We do see that um, we have these type of portraits as reflections of more formal and ritualized approaches to mourning at this time. And so what I mean by that is they would take the deceased and they would bathe them and they would dress them and then they would present them in a formal manner so that people could see these, these portraits and it would capture something of who the individual was um, in life. And so that was, that was part of it. The other motivation um, behind this, and this certainly is a reflection of the high mortality rates that we see with children as well as the elderly during this time, is for many of these individuals, this is the only photograph that they ever have taken. And so this explains to us why when we look at these post-mortem portraits, that they are disproportionately children as the subject because it's the idea that as children they don't need portraits because they grow up, they get their portraits then. But unfortunately for these children with the untimely death, it kind of turns out that this is the only documentation that there would be of these individuals. Now the other thing that's really interesting about post-mortem portraiture is that the style is really consistent. And basically what you're seeing is, again, these very formal presentations of the subject. But you can see, and you see it here, the um, photographs are very stoic, they're very serious, and they're very reverent. And of course, this is all very appropriate for the function of this type of portrait. Now, also keep in mind that during this time period, death most commonly occurred at the home. And so death was something that was very visible, it was familiar to people, and then, of course, it was very personal. And you can get the idea of these sort of personal ways that death is conceptualized when you look at these portraits. 
Now here we have another one. I'm just going to show one more. Just because I wanted you to see the consistency of, the, of these images. And you can see if you look at this, it has a lot of the same qualities that I just outlined when showing you the previous photograph. That again, it's very formal, it's very reverent, it's very stoic in its presentation. And what we often see is we often see that these um, deceased individuals, they're usually um, depicted sleepy. And this makes sense because when you think about sleep, sleep is something that is safe, it's familiar, but most importantly, it's temporary. And so in many ways, these act not only as a form of commemoration, right, which is important when we think about this idea of commemoration in the context of death. We're going to talk about this with the war. Not only does this function as a point of commemoration, but it also functions as a point of consolation. Consolation for the people <clears throat> who are left behind. <coughs> now, the timing of the Civil War is very important because a lot of things were happening. And as I explained to this gentleman here, one thing that's really interesting about the Civil War is it does emerge out of a backdrop of general change in general. Okay? So, for example, okay, we have photography as an artistic medium emerging in the late 1820s. And this actually happens simultaneously, unbeknownst to the two people who simultaneously develop in France with Louis Daguerre and the Daguerreotype and in England with Henry Louis Fox Talbert, who uh, has the, um, the uh, oh my gosh, it's leaving my mind, the calotype, the calotype. So once this is initially developed in the late 1820s, the pervasiveness of the technology, the pervasiveness of the photographic image spreads like wire, wildfire really, really quick. And it comes to America and it becomes really popular. So it positions photography well as the documentary medium of the Civil War. Now there's some other things that were happening at this time. At this time, we are also seeing a general rise in communications in America, particularly the newspaper. And the first national press in America established in the 1850s, so about a decade before the Civil War. And this alone had created this desire for the public to receive information, both in terms of text, but as well as visual. Okay, so you can start to see how this is nicely positioning the photograph to document the Civil War. But this goes against artistic tradition, because what happened in the past is that painting documented the Civil War, or, not, or anything, any kind of conflict documented by a painting. And so the question then becomes why? You know, and of course I've given you these answers, but why don't we see a lot of paintings that are documented in the Civil War? And the answer to this question is because a lot of painters weren't t treating the subject. And when they did, they treated it in very abstract ways, where they would trade the detailed objectivity of the photographic image for the sentimentality that painting allowed for. And so you see paintings like this that don't really tell us anything specific about the war. It just communicates idealized lofty versions of patriotism. And so the photograph factored in much better because people felt that, first of all, it was more directly connected to the history as it was unfolding. People felt that painting was too far away in the sense that it took the average painter about a year to paint a large-scale epic painting. And by then, you know, the war had dramatically changed within a year's time. People also felt that painting was too subjective, and that also it was too open to the creative license of the artist. They wanted something that was telling the truth, that was objective, trusty news reporting. Although we'll come to see, this idea that the photograph never lies, that does become a little bit of a misconception as uh, photography unfolds in the Civil War. <clears throat> 
So, the question is then, what kind of subjects did Civil War photography record that painting would not or could not? The answer, and I think this is an exciting answer, is a lot. There is a wide range of subjects that we see being captured throughout um, this war. And so it contextualizes the war in all of these different ways. Now, of course, we have the portrait. And the portrait is very important. I'm going to spend some time with you talking about um, the portrait in a little bit. Um, so the portrait is really important. And that um, surfaced as an immediate need to commemorate because one in five soldiers did not return from battle. We also see photographs that are documenting landscape, something more akin to what we're seeing here. Now we're seeing a range in landscape. We do see rural landscapes where many of these battles were fought. We are also though seeing urban landscapes as well, where there also were altercations, where you are just looking at sort of damaged landscape for other reasons. And then finally, which we're also going to look at today in this presentation, we have images of those who lost their lives in battle. So very wide range. Now what we don't really commonly see in Civil War photography are photos, photos of battles actually happening. The reason why we don't see this has to do with the nature of early <coughs> photography in terms of the equipment. These are not your little teeny cameras you know, that we have today that you can stick in your pocket. These were large. They were cumbersome, they were heavy, they were difficult to maneuver around. At this time, we're also seeing a relatively long exposure time. This is an albumin silver print. At this time, the average exposure time, 5 to 15 minutes. Okay. So what that means, right, remember in the olden days when we had those cameras with that stuff in it called film? And you had to like hold still while your picture was taken. You hold still while the film is exposed to light. Click, split second, you hold still, it records your image. With the exposure time of 5 to 15 minutes, it means that image cannot move for 5 to 15 minutes, right? So think about this, you guys. Having to take a portrait with a 5 to 15 minute exposure time, how are you going to hold still for that long, right? They had chairs that they would physically clamp you into. They clamp the back of your head, they clamp the back of your body. So when you look, not so much at the Civil War uh, photographs, but like a lot of the daguerreotypes and stuff, you'll see people like super stiff. Yeah. It's because they're literally clamped into a chair to hold still. So uncomfortable process. First of all, Matthew Brady was responsible for bringing the other most important photographers of the Civil War together. Now this group that he brings together they eventually part ways due to creative and business differences. But the important thing is that he brings them together, which encourages artistic collaboration and sends them out onto the battlefields. Now, in my mind, though, what makes Brady even more important is that he was the first to display these photos. And he did this in two locations. He did it at his um, primary gallery, which was in Washington, D.C., which was he called the National Gallery. And then he had a secondary gallery in New York. Now, these photos that Brady displayed are really important because they appeal to the curiosity of the public. Remember, the public had not really seen war imagery before because the photographs taken during the Mexican-American War, as well as the Crimean War, were not widely circulated. So now they're seeing these things for the first time. And so they really were fascinated, but also felt like they could better follow the unfolding of this war that many, many people were very personally invested in. The other thing that makes the display of these so important, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit more in depth later on in the talk, is that they do capture a national identity at a time when one was pointedly absent. The United States is splitting in half, pretty much. And we're fighting amongst ourselves. You know, what did that mean for Americans socially, culturally, economically, especially within the South? And people didn't really know where they fit in. And photography helped them to kind of get that idea about who we were as Americans 
during this time of crisis and upheaval. Now there's another reason why these photographs were so popular at the time. And that is because they presented the war in these very straightforward terms that people could understand. And what we most commonly see in the display of these photographs is there would be some sort of caption that would accompany the photograph. And that caption would kind of explain to the viewer <coughs> what they were looking at. And it would also kind of contextualize the, the photo as well. So this photograph that we see here, this is from Alexander Gardner's sketchbook. His sketchbook was a two-volume book that contained 100 photographs. It was the first photography book ever printed and distributed to the public, ever. And so he would have these photographs in the sketchbook, and he would have a caption that would accompany. So to rhetorically illustrate this, I have brought in the caption. So I'm going to read it, and then you can look at this picture and imagine what's happening as I'm reading this, this caption, okay? The dead horses, which, over here, the dead horses about this building indicate the terrific character of light. In the meantime, the rebels had forced back the left of our lines and would undoubtedly have gained possession of Round Top, but for the timely arrival of the Fifth Corps, which became hotly engaged, losing many valuable officers, but finally, Repulsing the enemy, thousands of dead were wounded and strewn all over the fields adjacent to this house. Now there's a reason why I'm reading this so dramatically, okay? Because that was the point. The point was to create these really dramatic captions that kind of appealed to the imagination of the audience. So that the audience could construct their own protagonists and antagonists in the situation. Also, even though there is a level of imagination that's involved here, again, this helps to present this war, this conflict, in ways that people could understand. And that was a problem people had with painting. It was too abstract. This was real, even though it was really imagination. And so there is a little bit of a problem here with this, okay? Because these type of captions, they did appeal to the imagination, and in turn that appealed to many people at the time, their tendency to romanticize the war, to see it as entertaining, and something that was exciting, and you know, brave, and gallant, you know, all these things. But I will say that this sort of romanticizing view does not last very long. Once we start to see consistently within Civil War photography, photographs, of those killed in battle, this romanticizing view goes away rather quickly. Portraiture. Now, in my art historical opinion, okay, and I will tell you this, I'm, I'm sorry if this disappoints you, I am not an expert on Civil War, okay? My area of interest, I actually study ancient art. This is a side interest of mine. I find that, the por that portraiture is probably the most important genre or type of subject that was produced during the Civil War. Here we have an example. Now, with this photograph, okay, what we see is actually a level of informality. This is surprising because we talked about how people are clamped in chairs and they have to sit just so. Here it's more informal. And it's interesting to see this informality sort of juxtaposed against the very formal title, right? This is very detailed, so that you know exactly the role that these men had in the military. Also, it's an interesting juxtaposition against the formality of their military uniform. So it's formal, but it's informal at the same time. Now, these are two brothers. And so what you see is you see this portrait 
that's sort of framing these ideas of masculine camaraderie, which many people associated that idea with the war, you know, men coming together and doing man stuff and fighting a war. Also, it frames the idea of family and more specifically brotherhood. And if you think about it, this, these are appropriate conceptual extensions to things like political devotion and patriotism. So they kind of go along with the, the sort of feelings that people were having. You know, the, this war, super personal to a lot of people, really important. And so it's a way for people to kind of internalize that and sort of attach it to their own identity. Now with the informality, the where we see it is primarily the poses, right? One of the brothers has his leg crossed. He has his arm on the shoulder of his other brother. I love the shared affection that we see between these brothers in this photograph. And what a lot of art historians have interpreted, and I tend to agree, is that this type of informality and a more positive image reflects a level of optimism. And unfortunately, this is very short-lived, okay? 1861, this is the year that the Civil War breaks out, okay? Many of us probably know the initial views that people had about the Civil War. No problem, it's gonna last like six months, no damage, it'll be totally fine. And that was not the case. And so once people really start to, to see how horrible this war was, and that it wasn't going away anytime soon, this level of optimism in the, the portraiture, it goes away. Could you read the caption, please, once you start? The Fincher Brothers, Company 1, 43rd Regiment, Georgia Volunteer Infantry, Army of Tennessee. <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> now, this is the portraits. They are the primary type of photograph that is taken during the American Civil War. As I said, we don't have a lot of photographs on the battlefield. The majority of Civil War portraits were taken in the studio, these type of portraits. So this portrait, again, illustrates this common approach that we see in the earlier years of the war, of this tendency towards optimism and informality. Now we can talk about that, you know, on a more smaller scale. And I talked about the idea of attaching, you know, the ideas of war to your personal identity. There's a wider implication here. When you see informal portraits like this, what they're doing is they're capturing a sense of the total individual. And this is so important when you think about the commemorative nature of these photographs. A truly good photograph, okay, and this is just basically our portrait. It doesn't matter the time period, the medium, whatever. A truly good photograph is going to capture not simply the physical likeness of the individual, what they look like, but will capture something of the personality of the, the figure. And this is important because, as I said, many people did not come home. Casualties in the Civil War, 630,000 people. As I said, one in five were killed. 51,000 in one battle alone, Battle of Gettysburg, right? So it was really important. And it was important for family members who lost loved ones in the war that they could commemorate and remember their loved ones as closely as possible. And it's not just remembering what they look like, right? But why do we love people? for who they are, right? And so it captures this, and I think that that is a beautiful thing. Now, in addition to what we see typically with the informality, we also see typically an inclusion of props, and this usually is weapons. And it makes sense because this complements well the other common feature, the uniform. The other thing that these photographs did and portraits did this before the Civil War. Portraits did it after. Portraits do it to this day, probably even more so with the pervasiveness of cameras and selfies and all that business, is presents the notion of the idealized self. So this guy, Private James House, 16th Georgia Cavalry, Army of Tennessee, wants to present himself 
the best he sees himself. And this is it. A guy with two knives. <laughs> but what makes Civil War portraiture so important is that it didn't just depict soldiers, who by the way average age 18 to 29. It depicted everybody. It depicted the wives, it depicted the children. And this makes sense because when the, the soldiers are out, when they're fighting, they want to look at their loved ones and remember them and think of home while they're away. We also, though, see photographs of slaves, portraits of slaves, portraits of emancipated slaves, portraits of politicians, everybody. And so when you think about Civil War photography, you might be thinking, oh, pictures of the battlefield. This is actually not, not quite the whole picture. It's everything. And that's why I said it's what's so exciting about Civil War photography is it's all sorts of subjects. And with the portraiture, because it's photographing people from all walks of life, we get a really nuanced perspective of what it was like to be in the Civil War. Not just for the soldiers, but for the children, for the wives, for the slaves, for the emancipated slaves. We get an idea of how this impacted everybody. And from a historical standpoint, this is a wealth of information. We see the first photographs that capture those who lost, who lost their lives in battle in 1862. The photographs that um, recorded the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam. Most art historians agree, though, that this does not become a um, common type of subject in Civil War photography until 1863. July of 1863, with the documentation of the Battle of Gettysburg. And then after that, this is a very, very common type of subject. Now, it's interesting, these type of photographs, because what happens is, with the introduction of capturing you know, those who are deceased, artists begin to kind of piece together common subjects into one photographic image. And so what you start to see is you start to see an integration of landscape, of portrait, and what I argue are um, components of the post-mortem portrait incorporated in as well. Now, these are rather formulaic images as well. And what I mean by that is they're similar to for example, the post-mortem portrait, where there's a very consistent stylistic approach. What we tend to see is that we tend to see the bodies located outdoors in landscapes that are very dramatic and very epic, right? <clears throat> Extends far back into space, large expanse of sky, right? This is very dramatic. This actually is typical of the type of landscape photographs that we see being taken during the Civil War. But what's different is that the landscape photographs were simply dramatic. In this case, the drama is no longer a compositional device. What's starting to happen is these landscapes become metaphorical. And they begin to represent things like loss, emptiness, suffering, death. Which is appropriate when you consider that they are depicting people that are you know, have lost their lives in, in the war. What we also tend to see happen is this <clears throat> effort on the part of the photographers to try to visually and conceptually integrate these men within the landscape as though they're actually part of nature. Now the first person to display these photographs, Matthew Brady, right? Also Alexander Gardner. The, the author artist of the sketchbook. When these were first displayed, the public was simultaneously horrified and fascinated, and they flocked to these galleries in droves by the thousands to come and look at this. And they had the option, if they would like, to closer inspect these type of photographs using magnifying glass. They even had the preference in some situations to look at them in an implied three-dimensional form through the use of the stereoscope, which was a binocular device where you put the two images in, and when you look through, 
it looks like it's a three-dimensional image. And in many ways, what this started to do is it started to kind of create a spectacle of the theater of war, which that alone can, you know, suggest some implications about the sort of psychological as well as social effects that the war had on the general population. The photographers begin to tighten up the compositional space, looking at a closer vantage point so that the images of death are much more apparent and assertive to the viewer. This is actually two specific locations or sites within a larger location, Devil's Den. And this was an appropriate location because it was a rocky outcropping. And so what happened is it allowed for the photographer to, as I said, tighten up the composition so that the viewer can't really look beyond the rocks. And it forces the viewer to really acknowledge the, the, the idea of death within these photographs. Now, um, these two images, okay, by Alexander Gardner, they're the same Confederate soldier. So it's the same soldier in two different locations, which is suggesting to us that there's manipulation happening here, right? <laughs> that he's not just coming in and finding this, okay? And of course the manipulation is the moving of the body. Also manipulative, the prop. This is also an inclusion of Gardner, which is interesting because it's the same type of props that are included in soldiers who have photographs taken while they're living. Now, remember, okay, at this time, photography equipment was cumbersome, it was a burden, it was hard to move around. So it's not like these photographers are just like coming across these bodies, okay? Oftentimes, they did actually not even hear about these battles until two to three days after. That's the average time it took for photographers to get to the battle site, two to three days. Which is why, again, we don't have many images of battles actually happening. And when they get there two to three days later, the soldiers, but more commonly the people that live nearby, are already sort of you know, cleaning away and laying the bodies to rest. So they're not just like coming across bodies, which we would imagine because of all of the casualties. So what happens is it, in many ways, kind of forced some of the photographers to engage in ethically suspect practices like moving bodies. Alexander Gardner obviously was guilty of that. And he didn't deny it. He actually justified it. And he said, well, these photographs, they're meant to be more of an expression of idea and not a documentary truth. But this is problematic because the public was expecting and assuming that these photographs were documentary truth. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect in terms of what the public thought they were getting in, terms, in comparison to what they were actually getting. And this photograph here, Harvest of Death by Timothy O'Sullivan, this is easily the most famous photograph to come out of the entire Civil War. I can't, as an art historian, talk about the Civil War and not show it. It's against art historians' laws. I have to show this to you. <laughs> this is another photograph that indicates that subtle manipulation that we saw in the photographs um, that Gardner took. These actually were Union soldiers that were killed. O'Sullivan went in and changed it to intimate that these are Confederate soldiers. And he did that to fulfill the Union agenda, okay? And I want to just interject really quick. The Union, the North, they pretty much controlled artistic production of these photographs, okay? The economy in the South could not support investing in this type of documentation, but also because the North had blocked trade, they couldn't get supplies in for the photographers. So when we look at Civil War documentation, you're really primarily looking at it from the perception of the North. So just keep that in mind, okay? So the, to have these be dead Confederate soldiers better fits the Union agenda. It suggests that the North is winning the war, okay? 
And then also it makes these images commercially lucrative, okay? Brady's not just like the super nice guy that's like, hey, I'm just doing this because I want to be a historian. No, this allowed Brady to make a lot of money, right? And so this was so commercially lucrative that these men who owned these large photographic studios, like Brady, right, Sullivan worked for Brady, made him a lot of money and encouraged them to continually produce these photographs throughout the duration of the war. So when we talk about, you know, oh, you know, the Civil War, documented from beginning to end. Why is that so? Well, it's possible because of photography, but there was an economic incentive to document this as well. So anyways, that's why O'Sullivan did this. But he did other things, like he turned the head so that it's facing the camera. And he does that to kind of up the, the dramatic impact. Again, ethically problematic. Now, harvest of death, right? And I think that this is why this photograph stands out more so than the other ones, is the, the presentation of the subject paired with this title really has this kind of emotional resonance. Mm -hmm. And it really speaks to death in these really kind of metaphorical terms that are uh, very compellingly attested to visually by the way that we have the back and it's all blurry. And so idea is this field, its crop is death, right? This is the kind of tragedy that war reaps, is death. As far as the eye can see into our dramatic landscape, which we know is typical, as far back as we can see, all you can see are bodies. And then of course faded, blurred, you have uh, soldiers and people tasked away with clearing the body. They're ghost-like in their appearance, which helps to convey these ideas uh, of death. It's these photographs that begin to change the, the perception that the public had of war. Prior to this, it's this is assumption that war is gallant, it's gentlemanly. These dashing, handsome young men put on their uniforms and they have a spot of tea, and then they go out, and then they have a battle, and then they stop, and then they have tea, <laughs> People thought this. People thought this. And in, in fact, there's images that come from the beginning of the Civil War that show that very thing. Officers sitting around, handsome in their uniforms, having tea, very, um, you know, sophisticated and cultured. Those go away. Those go away. But at the beginning, that's what people thought. And even that's what the photographers first thought. And in many ways, I suspect, it's what the soldiers thought as well. And so people saw this, and they couldn't idealize or romanticize war any longer. And at this point in 1863, I think people are kind of getting the idea that war, this war was going to have a very, very high toll in terms of the psychology of the individuals and the nation, in terms of uh, the, the land, the economy, and of course the, the high casualty rate. All these, these men, these young men that um, are killed in war and as you can see, it intensifies, it intensifies. And we begin to see this perception of the soldier begin to change. And if you think about it, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty shocking because we started by looking at these photographs of these soldiers who are living with this intent that, to humanize them, right? To show them as the total individual, a, a person, a personality, and then we see images of them newly deceased. And now we have it to where it's the display of simply the remains. And um, I think what this indicates is I think it indicates a relative level of desensitization on the part of these artists, but as well as the public, that they're accepting and that they're tolerating these type of images. Now this is, this is a hard photograph, and it's gruesome. Um, but there's a level of appropriateness to it, which I know it sounds bad, but this site that this photograph was taken in was a site where they had two battles fought in the same location two years apart. The Battle of Gaines Mill, Battle of Cold Harbor. Combined casualties in these two battles alone, at this one spot, in this one spot, 20,000 people died. In this one spot. And so when you look at this, okay, this is real. This is saying this is what's happening here. It's not sugar-coated. It's very honest. It's very direct. There's not manipulation here. 
except for choices like taking the image at a low vantage point. So this kind of is in the middle of the composition, close and set in the foreground. There's those kind of <coughs> compositional considerations. But this is what was really happening. You know, Ricky didn't change anything. And in some ways, photographs like this are almost a means to an end. Six days after this photograph is taken, this very photograph, six days, General Lee surrenders in Appomattox. War ends. I initially gave this talk to, uh, this is about three years ago, to commemorate the, uh, the Gettysburg Address that Lincoln gave in 1863. And I'll admit it, I didn't know that much about the Gettysburg Address. You know, it had been a really long time since I had studied that in school. And so I went back and, and I read it. And what, sh what really surprised me was that what Lincoln was doing and trying to do and what he was saying was the same thing that the photographs were trying to do as well. I was really shocked at the, the parallels that I saw. People say that the Gettysburg Address, and I agree with this, is one of the most important speeches in our nation's history. Why is it so important? Well, what Lincoln was trying to do, first of all, is he was trying to establish a national identity, again, at a time when there wasn't one. He was trying to honor the sacrifices that the people were making as part of the war. And he wanted to encourage people, hey, this is hard, but let's power through this. We're, we're working for the greater good here. Photography was doing the same thing. Okay? We have seen photographs that show this desire to seek out an identity, right? to negotiate where it is that one can reside within a, a war-torn nation. And I'm not talking about where, like, are you living in Tennessee or Virginia, but where in terms of your identity and what it means for you to be an American. We have seen photographs that are acknowledging and honoring the sacrifice that people made. They gave their lives for this, you know, this political cause, whether they were on the side of the North or the South. With the humanization of the individuals we see in these portraits, it puts a face to this, this conflict. And these are real people that lived through this and they were affected by it. But there's a commonality there, that we were all Americans, whether you were at the North or the South, or you were you know, conflicted, you didn't know. Everybody was experiencing this, everybody was affected by it, no matter what political alliance you had. So in the end, we're left with these visual documents that are so critical because they do give us the insight of what our national identity was. And what I say as an art historian that makes these visual documents even more important is that for art, they connect art and life in these really real and really direct and really emotional and really intense and really honest ways. What it also does though is it conceptualizes and it documents armed conflict in ways that forever change within art. Thank you. Mm -hmm.